If you look at the world that we live in, you realize it's really incredible. I mean, look at all the arts, the sciences, the inventions, the ideas. It is endless. And the more that we look inward, the more we find. It's called being curious. And at this time, right now, you have access to more information right at your fingertips than any time in history. So come hunt and gather some collective knowledge as we embark on an endless journey in search of perspective, adding it to our big picture along the way. All you need is an open mind. You got it? Good. Because there is no time to waste when you are watching The Millennium Show. All right, on this episode of The Millennium Show, we're going to talk about podcasts. Uh, we're going to connect the dots and just take a look. Um, podcasts have made learning very entertaining, as I've noticed. Um, they're very inspirational. They've changed a lot of people's lives, if you notice. Yeah, and it's uh, you can put it on your phone, and it's audio, so you can bring it with you in the car. Yeah, jogging, it's very efficient. To it. yeah. yeah, I mean, I notice like, when I'm in the gym and stuff like that, you know, working out can be tedious, or driving in the car, you, know, you don't want to listen to music. Put on a podcast, man. It's very fun. It's it's better than the radio so a lot. Yeah, you, you know, so much. you can pinpoint what you want to hear. So we're gonna name a few, uh, and then you can check out and check them out, and maybe find some own, some of your own. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the Cosmos, the voice of the Cosmos special. If you haven't seen that, check it out. Um, he has a podcast called Star Talk, and basically he's an astrophysicist. So physics is very dense. It's not really, it's not always it's fun. Hard to grasp. Yeah, yeah it's and boring. he he breaks it down. He makes it fun. Yep. You know, he brings it's a lot of best, uh, he brings comedians on there. I've noticed, and uh, it's just a great it's a great thing if you if you are interested in science but you can't find the right medium to get your information. Check that out, um, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. You know a lot about her. Yeah, she's got a PhD in biomedical science. And yeah, and she's pushing the lines of natural like medicines. Uh huh. So her big thing right now is sulforaphane, which she's obsessed with like broccoli seeds and sprouting your own seeds and right. stuff. And it's really like a renaissance in the medical uh, she's a big, industry. She's a big like health and fitness kind of. Health and fitness. Yeah. Great role model for women everywhere. Yeah, man. definitely. Well, she was on the Joe Rogan Experience. What's her podcast name? It's Found My Fitness. Found My Fitness? Okay, yeah. so definitely check that out. I have heard about her. I She was on the Joe Rogan Experience, which Joe Rogan, that's probably my favorite podcast. Um, yeah. he, he just brings a lot of different people to the table. You know, a lot of experts. A lot and of specialists in yeah. different areas. And he's he's basically just a stand-up comedian. Not just, he's a lot. He's a stand-up comedian, a UFC commentator, and he's got his own podcast. And he does a lot of other interesting things on the side. Uh, he's a very complex human being, very, very inspirational. But he's, he's brought Neil deGrasse Tyson and Rhonda Patrick both, both to a show. Both yeah. to a show yeah. multiple times and talked to them. Very by diverse show. Oh, super diverse. So if you if you are into just a lot of different things, definitely check out the Joe Rogan Experience. Uh, very, very great show. I listen to it almost every single day. So um, so that's just for a few podcasts to name a few. Wanted to get in touch with you guys. And uh, stay tuned because the next segment is coming up next. You're watching The Millennium. All right, here we are. We're about half an hour north of Oxford out in some state land, kind of by North Branch. And we're going to take a hike back into the woods. Uh, we're going to set up a camp. Joe here uh, does a lot of winter camping up in Marquette. Uh, he does a lot of camping, a lot of hikes. So he's yeah. going to show us how to uh, properly set up kind of just a basic camp. Yeah, super basic, just a shelter, um, basic fire skills, starting fires, and I'll show you how to do some wrapping and frapping as well. So awesome. We'll just look some basic stuff. It. It'll be good. What do we got here on our back? What do we got? Right now, we kind of just got like a day pack on. Um, we don't have all of the essentials you'd want if you're like backpacking for a week, like right. lip balm and 
sunglasses actually, and, like important. sunscreen and stuff like that. Right, stuff you would never think about, but we just have essentials for a day. So we're just we're gonna try to like bring to the camera, bring to the show, uh, just some things that most people really don't know about going out camping. It seems yeah. simple, but there's a lot, there's a lot to it. All right, well, we hiked back about a couple miles, I'd say. Yeah. And that. and uh, we're so we found like a little spot where it's a little clearer. The brush was kind of it's kind of thick it's pretty in some thick spots down here. Yeah, it really is compared to what I'm used to. Yeah, but. it's a lot. So um, we found a little area here. I think we're gonna set up a camp here, and uh, Joe's gonna show us the way. Yeah. So first thing you gotta do is just find where you wanna stay for the night, and step one is just clear everything out. Okay. Make sure there's somewhere to lay down. All this. All this debris, like this sort of stuff, we need to get rid of all that, and right. So is, you just have dirt on the ground. It's ideal. Is there, um, is there like a certain, like type of tree that you wanna to have around, or does it really matter? Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if if you have birches around, you can use the birch bark for fire starter. Okay. Um, hemlocks, if you want to camp below those, they actually stop a lot of rain, so that like when you're actually staying underneath the hemlock, you won't receive as much rain okay. on your tent or whatever shelter you're using. Just okay. Some things you can look for. Okay. So we're just going to clear out right now. We're going to clear a little space and uh, get started. All right. Sounds good. All right. So second priority when you first get out here after you're done cleaning everything is you want your sleep system all ready for you. In case things don't work out, you can just hop in bed and go to bed. That's really what matters out here. So what we did there is we grabbed three long, fairly straight sticks. Uh, they're going to be used to make our basically our tent with just a tarp. It's an efficient way. It's cheaper than having to go to the store and buy a tent. All right, so we finally got our tarp down. We have it staked out and everything like that. Now we want to get our sleep system out. And this is just an insulated inflatable pad. That you can pick up and it's really a lifesaver, especially in the winter time. It's very essential if you're camping. And so, if you have any other clothes just for sleeping, you know, long johns, shirts, all dry stuff that you brought out here extra, you can throw it in here to keep it warm. And if you have a down bag, it's essential to bring it out uh, very quickly and set it up so the down can inflate. So I'm just gonna slide this in here and that's where we're sleeping tonight. Yeah, so what we got here is Joe told me to find some wood in three different categories. He described this as pencil lead thickness, yep. pencil thickness, and thumb thickness. And this is for starting the fire, correct? Yep. All right, so I found some birch bark and also some lint, which you can just get from your laundry um, dryer at home. And we're going to mix this up a little bit, make sure there's a lot of air in there. We're going to light this up and throw them on. We got our uh, fire hot enough now that we can start making food. We got some onions and we got some sausage, and some noodles. So we're gonna boil up some water and we got this nice little frying pan. Throw that sausage and show stuff on. Some onions, so let's be a good dinner. The one thing I notice about when you're eating food outside is that it always tastes better. It really does. See, you put in all that work and. Uh, you get out of the house and you come out here and it's fresh air and you're, you know, you have to work to get a fire going. Every, you realize how much work actually things are and how our modern societies really just cut corners for us and just basically spoon feed everything to us. So when you get done, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, hiking or hunting or setting up a camp, and you sit down, you know, you appreciate it more and it's, it's just a great thing to do. There's just something about coming out here and being in the woods. It's not like you're getting away from home but you're like returning to it and it's really humbling and just reminds you how insignificant our lives are and how society really doesn't matter and all our, our job and our financial situation and all of that it really really doesn't matter and it's, it's kind of meditative when you're out here you're just listening to the trees and the birds and stuff and it just reminds you who we actually are as homo sapiens.
right, on this episode of The Millennial Show, we are going to dive into the right brain and look at some great musicians. Um, both of these musicians we were noticed the other day have a lot of similarities and also have some big, great polar opposites. And we, we both look up to them very much and we like their music. So we're looking at Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys and famous jazz composer Charles Mingus. Right. Um, well, we've both been Brian Wilson fans for a long time. Long time. Yeah. And uh, we've listened to his music over and over again. And then you recently kind of encapsulated yourself in the world of Mingus. Yep, and it was the first, my first step into listening to jazz. Yeah. And it got me really excited about jazz, just the way he puts things and following jazz progressions and stuff like that. It's totally oh, new to me. The it's new crazy. music is huge. Yeah. You know, and I bet you the fact that you listen to Brian and listen to a lot of these other musicians that are geniuses at heart is why you were able to appreciate jazz from the get-go. Yeah. You know? Uh, well, one thing we did notice, a big, big, uh, a big similarity amongst these two was their mental instability overall. Yep. They were both diagnosed with schizophrenia, right. just minor forms of that. That's crazy. And... Like Brian, he was lived in his bed for two to three years. Two to three years. Just sat in his bed, ate some steaks. Ate steaks. He just got had a complete road. mental breakdown. Yeah. Um, but he was and a genius. He was a genius. He was a genius. And same thing with Mingus. He was actually in a mental institution. Yeah. And I know. I remember you telling me that's that. That's where he actually wrote uh, the, his most famous album that we'll talk about later. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they're crazy, but they're both composers and they're both leaders of their band. Um, but... They're both kind of they're kind of misfits, you know. They're kind of they don't really fit in anywhere, and they're constantly changing. They're extremists. Very extreme. But the there was a big uh, a big difference, on a polar opposite on their attitude that reflected in their music that we were talking about. Yeah. It was there. Yeah. Go ahead. Like when you listen to Charles Mingus, it's very aggressive, like in your face. He's like getting that bass going, and he's keeping the band going. Right. And he's like trying to get people solo, like a little bit faster, just trying to force it out of them, kind of like Whiplash. Right, right. Like, I bet you he was a lot like that in person. All the, the um, um, the band leader, yeah. The guy. If you've seen Whiplash, you know what we're yeah. talking about. And um, he actually, if there was anybody quitting his band, like someone would give him his two weeks, and he'd punch him out because he'd be so upset that they're quitting his band. Yeah. And it's he crazy. actually ruined this guy's top lip. He couldn't hit certain notes on oh, the trombone man. for the rest of his career. God, that's <laughs> nuts. Man. Yeah, he's angry man. And then, I'm, and then you have Brian, who also does lead his band. He, he, you know, he is the composer, just yeah. like Mingus. But he's very sensitive. He's kind of passive about things. A lot you know, of love ballads. A lot of love ballads. Yeah. yeah, a lot of songs about love and teenage and uh, stuff like that. That's what his greatest, his greatest album. Of all time, from 1966, Pet Sounds, which is probably my favorite album I've ever heard. Yeah, it's um, fantastic. It's yeah. it's kind of just about growing up in a way, you know. Really? The, the whole the album, it's a concept album, and it's the music that makes him a genius. You know, yeah. he had other people writing a lot of his lyrics for him, but it's the music, and it actually follows a lot of jazz progression. Definitely, you know? it was like a studio album. How complex it was, and it's like it can only be created in the studio. Yeah, the Beach Boys, as just the Beach Boys can play. Yeah, you know. Uh -huh, um, well, what is what is Mingus's like pet sounds? What is his so, big one? Yeah, his pet sounds album is one the one he wrote in the Mental Institution. Oh wow! And it was Black Saint Sinner Lady. Okay. And he actually said that that's proof as to how he got out of the Mental Institution. Really? Was this album that he wrote then? He wrote it in his head. Yeah. Right. He well, didn't I'm have, sure he wrote it down on paper. But, but he didn't have an instrument. No instrument. Yeah. So. You got to know music that yeah, way. Yeah, that was from '63, so it's that time period too of. The 60s where music was very innovative, and right. breaking boundaries, okay, and changing this whole style of music as we know it. Yeah, wow, that's incredible. So both very musically gifted. So we want to just kind of encourage you guys out there to open your minds up to all these great musicians Definitely. out there. There's a lot of good music coming out, um, but if you go back and look at the history, there's a lot of great artists back then uh, that you know a lot of kids our age are not listening to. So we want to bring it to the millennials. We want to bring it to the new generations. Because it will help music uh, evolve as time goes on as well. If you have these these appreciations for all these older older artists, Definitely. you know. So go back, listen to the classical music, listen to jazz, listen to everything. Don't don't forget about rap and the pop culture. All that is coming together. It will follow a trend. Yeah. You know. You notice that. So check it out though. Brian Wilson and Charles Mingus, uh, Black Saint Center Lady, and Pet Sounds. Great stuff. So stay tuned. You're watching the Millennial Show.
On this episode of Before the Millennials, we are going to venture into the incredible world of Mr. Alan Wilson Watts. Watts existed from the early 1900s into the early 70s as a British philosopher, writer, and speaker. Obsessed with Eastern philosophy, Watts was known well for its interpretation into the Western world. In his lifetime, he overwent Zen training, received a master's degree in theology, became an Episcopal priest, all before moving to California to join the American Academy of Asian Studies. He wrote more than 25 books and articles, including In Psychotherapy East and West, The Joyous Cosmology, and Nature, Man and Women, which Watts described as the best book he ever wrote from a literary point of view. His words are still respected and heard today as Alan Watts is one of the greatest philosophical minds of the 20th century. Alan Watts, everybody, um, what a great mind, what a great uh, philosopher of his time period. Uh, he's basically, you know, settled in like Eastern philosophy as we know, um, but he was also very widespread over uh, many different fields. Yeah, from the 60s and 70s. 60s and 70s. Oh, I know. Yeah. From that time period, the stuff that he was saying, mm -hmm. was it still holds today. Yeah, it's so revolutionary. Very revolutionary. And his beard, too. Oh, that was also revolutionary. For sure, man. Absolutely. And that kind of shows the Eastern in him. Yeah, it, you know it totally I mean? does. So, But um, some of that insight that he brought me, and I'm sure many others, is that what he does is that while you're listening to his speech, he gives you this really abstract sentence. Yeah. And you're, you're trying to break it down. You have no idea what he's talking about. And what he's doing is that he's laying you in this path. This like thought experience, this like trail of thought that he's guiding you down, and the whole time you're critically thinking and trying to like figure this out and practice on that mentality. And what happens in the end is that he wraps everything up, and things start clicking. Very. You start applying. You start understanding. It's like he knows what you're going to think after every statement, yeah. after every lesson or everything yeah. he says. Yeah. And then he answers it later on. Uh -huh. Especially in his speeches. Well, like a lot of his speeches are online and stuff. And I mean, the one that really struck me from the get go was how to make yourself a better person. Mm -hmm. I mean, that one, and there's a great video. Great video. There's a lot of other stuff on there. I mean, tons of material. This guy, I mean, his whole life, he just, he just sat around and thought, it seems that's, like. I mean, he did amazing, a lot of stuff with his but... life. But so, how to make yourself a better person, you're saying it's very controversial because the title doesn't really. Not it's contra contra contradicting. contradicting. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's it's the title is telling you how to improve yourself, but we'll touch later that it's it's really not that at all. It's not that at all. No. Well, basically, it starts off um, by him saying betterment. Um, everyone wants to be better. Mm -hmm. However, the reason you want to be better is the reason you're not. And he was talking about how human beings are always chasing something. They're always trying to be better, and that is an ongoing vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And as soon as you get to that point. You realize there's something you're not, as well you're not better at. You're so always you're chasing lead that way. Right? Yeah. Well, he he came to that conclusion. He says in the video, um, on his own journey, he said he went from he started off in the ordinary, uh, and he went from like you know food and love and possessions, simple, passions simple like things that. that everyday people value, people yes. want. And he said it, he didn't find it there, so he moved on, and he went into the arts and the literature and the poetry. He got a little more depth. Just trying to find that. That strive out of it. What is get this that feeling? What is this all about? Yeah. yeah, and and that definitely gave him something. But he's constantly wanting more. He yeah. kept going for more. Yeah. So he moved on. He figured it wasn't in there. He went to psychoanalysis. Wasn't in there. And uh, he eventually came to the conclusion. He even went to the religions and and uh, theology and and whatnot. And although all these things encapsulate who Alan Watts really is, you know, I mean, they they led to who he is collectively. They weren't the answer for how to be the best you the you best, can be, yeah. and that very thing, the how to be the best, is the problem itself. Is what he points out. Um, he also says doing good for yourself or even doing good for others oftentimes is amazingly destructive. Yeah, which is really confusing when you first yeah. read that. I mean, the first time I read that, I was I thought like, how can doing good for other people do anything wrong? Yeah. You know, why? Yeah, because your intention is to try and, like, be selfless and try to help somebody out. Right. And give your physical effort or mental effort, whatever it is. Yeah. And try to help someone out. But internally, um, it's selfish. Right. Well, it's it's yeah. filled. He says that it's filled with conceit. He says that, how do you know what is good for other people? Yeah. You know what I mean? He thinks that 
when you're trying to help other people, you know what's good for them. Or you know what's good for yourself. Yeah. And he said that if you knew how to improve yourself, you'd already be improved. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you don't know. And there's just this ongoing chase forever. Mm -hmm. for, and forever. there's no people that are placed up on that pedestal where it's like they have it all figured out. Never. There's never, never been a person ever. No. Nope. And um, so that's the problem with humans. So he says basically you should accept that, that there is nothing. Why try and fight it? There's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we, we can do to improve oneself. And he, he even says, you know, that is going to rub people the wrong way many, many times because all culture is dedicated to self-improvement. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, all the revolutions and, and the cultures that exist, they're all just going towards this, this new higher thing that's going to be just immaculate, perfect. Yeah. And even on a personal scale of learning a new instrument, right? reading another book, educating yourself, like those are all just improving yourself. Yeah, and not to say that those are bad. No. You know what not. I mean? You don't want to you don't want to go too far. I don't think he wants you to say, "Oh, I'm not going to do anything." Yeah. But he does he wants if you're aware of this, I think it will improve your life. You'll get the best of both sides. Right, right. Well, the conclusion is brilliant. The conclusion is that if we sit there and do nothing, and we just observe, and we just watch what happens, that we will realize that human beings are nature, that we're already doing the great things naturally, that the great things we're doing are already happening. Mm -hmm. And that's, we just forget to look at them. That's great. Yeah. That's good news if you think about it. It's very good news. I mean, that, that yeah. You just, just us following our natural patterns is actually what we're meant to be right, doing. Right, right. Well, like when he said that, this was really important to me. He said that like humans don't congratulate themselves on growing a, a, an eye, like having an eye and having one of the most complex things that ever has struck life that we know of. Yeah. Um, to be able to see and all that thing, that's real. That's real virtue. He calls it virtue, and that's that's a good thing. But we don't. We just take it for granted because it's natural. Mm -hmm. But those are the things we should be looking at, just who we are and, and just to have our nature. We don't want to get in the way. Definitely. So. And what a great... So just simply observe. Yeah. So definitely, Alan Watts, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of different videos. We just wanted to briefly touch on this one that really stuck out to me, I'm sure you as well, mm -hmm. um, from the get-go. A lot of, lot of great videos out there. Um, he's written a lot of material, a lot of speeches, a lot of books out there. I think we have a book. You have that? Yeah. Book? Yeah. Right here, actually. It's called The Book. The Book. Yeah. So you can find him, book. I'm sure you can find him in a library, in a bookstore, anywhere. He's very well known. Uh, Eastern philosophy and a lot of other things, but uh, so check them out. Get in touch, Alan Watts. So, but make sure don't go anywhere. We have archery coming up next and hunting. So we're gonna show how hunting connects to this complex organism that we're all a part of. So stay tuned. You're watching the Millennial Show. All right, we're out here. This is uh, our archery segment of the Millennial Show. Uh, archery is something we both recently got into. We're yep. very, very new at it. Yeah, just the past couple months we've been shooting and setting our bows in and yeah. working out the kinks. We got, we each got compound bows. Uh, we're practicing. We haven't done any hunting yet, uh, but we plan on doing some deer hunting this fall. Definitely. Uh, that was something that we never really had an open mind to before. Yeah, totally. Like in high school and stuff, I was all against it. Just thought it was just right. Uh, just like destructive. And yeah. You never want to do that. Right. And now, the, the way I look at hunting now is that if you look at nature and everything out in nature, when you go out for a walk, yeah, you're, you're observing nature, but everything else in nature besides humans are always trying to, like, kill one another. And conquer. And conquer, yeah. And when you go out hunting, you become a part of it. You, you notice that, you know, you're part of nature and you, you notice things that you never would look at before. You're actually participating you're partici in nature. I know. Yeah, and that's it's really cool. It's really interesting. So It's a totally different mindset. As soon as you get out there, you're like looking for rubs or like deer lay down and stuff. It's like totally different um, mentality when you're out there. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm really, really excited to do some hunting this fall. Yep. Totally new, you know, to step out of your comfort zone, whatever it is, I think is a very healthy thing to do. Uh, it gives you a whole new perspective on everything, yeah. you know, it changes. Even ethically speaking, yeah. like, if you eat meat and you've never killed an animal in your life, that's kind of unconnected. Yeah, you because you, be you technically are, you're, you're, you're contributing to the killing of animals, whether you do it yourself or not. So you're going you're gonna to appreciate the animal more. You should have that full connection. Absolutely, I agree completely. 
So we're gonna show you us just some slinging some arrows. We want to thank you guys for watching this episode of The Millennial Show. We had a great time filming it and making it and bringing it to you guys. And we want to thank you guys for watching. And keep your eye out for the next episode because we will be coming back. So stay tuned for more. You were watching The Millennial Show. We'll see you soon.